This next section will talk about wave properties of matter. And that is right, not, you're not missing anything here. We're gonna take things that have mass and think about their wave properties, right? So we did wave properties of light and we talked about like frequency and uh, wavelength of light. Then we did um, the particle properties of light where we talked about the energy of a photon, things like the photoelectric effect. And now wave properties of matter. So the scientist de Broglie, de Broglie, again, I never know how to say this name, in 1924 said that matter can also exhibit this wave particle duality. Now, the problem is that you only discern this when the particles are small enough. So we don't observe wavelengths and frequencies for macroscopic objects. But for things like electrons, protons, and neutrons, we can observe things like wavelength for those objects. So <clears throat> we have to use an equation that lets us calculate the wavelength that includes the mass of that object, right? That's what's going to scale it into or out of the discernible range. So this equation is that the wavelength is h over mv. h is still Planck's constant. m is the mass. v is the velocity. So if you kind of go through and you follow and track all of your units, you should get a wavelength unit out of this. So this is, right, I have this written in red, I have it underlined, you must have mass in order to use this equation. You cannot use this equation for photons because photons don't have mass. And you can't use the photon equation for something with mass because the mass has to be accounted for. So wave particle duality, we've kind of alluded to it in the earlier sections. Um, what is important and what matters and why we care at this point in chemistry is because electrons exhibit wave properties and particle properties. But since we're in the quantum mechanics chapter, everything is weird. We cannot observe them simultaneously. So we can observe an electron acting like a wave, but at the same time, we can't observe it acting like a particle. Or we can observe an electron acting like a particle, but we won't be able to observe it acting like a wave. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So that is what the entire Heisenberg uncertainty principle is about. It is just that if you know one thing about an electron really well, it is impossible to know the other thing about that electron really well. So the equation for the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is that delta x times m delta v is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. So delta x is the uncertainty in position. So that means if my position measurement is x, it's at this specific position, x plus or minus delta x would be, I know the position of my electron. It is at this spot plus or minus, we'll just say meters, this, this many meters. And a small delta x means that I know it really well. A big delta x means that I don't know it very well at all. Then the times m delta v, the delta v is the uncertainty in velocity. So V plus or minus delta V would be my velocity. So I have a, an uncertainty in velocity, right? The position is the particle property. The velocity is the wave property. And what, right, this is all like kind of hinging around H over four pi, which is a constant, right? H is Planck's constant. This is just going to make it so that if I don't know my position very well, then I do know my velocity very well. If I suddenly know my position very well, I cannot know my velocity very well. We are going to plug numbers, do calculations with this equation. So let's do it with an example. And our example is that we have an electron. It's traveling at 
3.7 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. It has an uncertainty velocity of 1.88 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And we want to know what is the uncertainty in position. So my first question is actually like, well, let's gauge whether our uncertainty in position is big or small. So let's do it by determining if delta V is big or small. So the velocity was 3.7 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. The uncertainty in the velocity was 1.88 times 10 to the fifth. So my velocity of this electron is 3.7 times 10 to the fifth plus or minus 1.88 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So the range that I know, my velocity is somewhere in the range of 5.58 times 10 to the fifth meters per second to 1.82 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. That's a big range. That's a very big range of velocities. I would expect that we will get a small uncertainty in position when we get to the end of this calculation. So let's do the actual calculation. Um, I have the equation here written again for Heisenberg uncertainty. And I really like to rearrange things before I plug in the numbers. So I have rearranged this so that we're just solving for delta x, which has to be greater than or equal to h over 4 pi m delta v. So the things that we know, uh, delta x is greater than or equal to, h is a constant, right? Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th. Then in the bottom, 4 and pi are constants. M is the mass of the object. So it's the mass of the electron. And then the uncertainty in the velocity of the electron. So I'm only plugging in the 1.88 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. The 3.7 times 10 to the fifth meters per second, the actual velocity, that was extra information. I don't actually need it to solve the problem. It's It was in there and helpful to figure out what range my delta x was gonna be in. But other than that, I could have solved the problem without that information. So it's only the uncertainty that goes in. And looking at my units, the seconds in Planck's constant will cancel with meters per second, but I am, right, I'm in this situation where I need to know the definition of a joule, that kilograms, meters squared, I've forgotten it at this point, but it's written down on the equation sheet. This should, in the end, leave you with just meters for the unit. So my uncertainty in position is 3.08 times 10 to the minus 10th meters. This is super tiny. This is like 0.3 nanometers. So I know the position really well, which is expected because I did not know the velocity really well. Okay, so when we are thinking about wave properties, one of the properties of waves is that they can interfere with each other. So they can interfere with each other in one of two ways. They can interfere constructively, which it means that they build each other up, or they can interact destructively, which means they cancel each other out. So I have some pictures, right? We're gonna kind of like graphically think about what this would look like, but I also have a link on Canvas to how noise canceling headphones work. So what noise canceling headphones are doing and why they go through their charge so quickly is that it, the headphone is gathering noise. It's gathering the noise information around you and generating a wave that will perfectly destructively interfere or as perfect as it can get. It will destructively interfere with the noise around you, which cancel that, cancels that noise out. So the first... Um, interference that we're going to look at is this constructive interference. So it's this picture on the left. I have wave one and wave two. So the red wave and the blue wave, if they are traveling the way that they are traveling, they're lined up and they're together. And 
we want to see like what would the result wave be if these were both traveling in the same spot. The way that you do that, you can kind of just estimate this graphically is by like going to every point and looking at the amplitude of the waves and adding the amplitudes together. Now it turns out, right, I've got these yellow dashed lines, wave one, wave two, the crest or the highest part of each wave is lined up with the highest part of the other wave. And the low part is lined up with the low part. So let's just say that the amplitude at the highest spot of wave one is plus one. Wave two is the same, the highest spot is plus one. Well, those two high spots line up together. So a plus one and a plus one gives me a plus two, which is why my purple wave, which is right, a little hint of red and blue together, my purple wave has a highest point of plus two. Right? This is the resulting wave where I've added together every point. Now, in the right column, you can still consider it adding together every point. Right? We're putting these waves together. But do you see how they are, like, not lined up with each other. They're like perfectly opposite each other. So the crest of the first wave is lined up with the trough of the second wave. So I've got a plus one and I'm adding it to a minus one, which is why there's zero amplitude in my purple line of wave one plus wave two. So the picture on the left, we call this in phase usually. And things that are in phase with each other constructively build up. The, this is sort of like, it's a little bit generalized because they don't have to be perfectly lined up like this. Um, things that are out of phase tend to cancel each other out. So this phasing, like I said, it doesn't have to be perfect, but this is what you want to associate in phase, constructive, build stuff up, out of phase, destructive, cancel stuff out. For waves in real life, these things could be like mostly in phase and a little bit out of phase. And then we would just get interesting looking waveforms that aren't perfect, but you would still see points of constructive and points of destructive interference. So waves and particles behave differently in the single and double slit experiments and so this is what we're going to go into next. There's also going to be some great videos that go with these experiments. Um, and of course, it's going to get super weird when we try to deal with electrons. So when you have a wave, it will bend or diffract around an obstacle. So I've got a picture here of how waves diffract. We even started um, an earlier video with talking about like bending waves when they go into a prism. So any wave that runs into an obstacle will bend around it. So you've probably, you could imagine seeing this in like a water wave where if it is flowing and it hits a rock, you can see a change in the direction of that wave because of the obstacle of the rock. So the experiment that we do is we have a barrier that has a narrow slit in it and then we have the waves approaching the barrier and the slit is now the obstacle. And so the waves will bend around that point. Now, this kind of picture, right, it just is a bunch of lines going up to a barrier. This is like a top view. So if you imagine like an aerial view of the ocean, you see, well, near the beach, if there, if there are waves, you see just kind of like the top crest lines of those waves um right you can't see it like the side view is the one that goes up and down this is a top view and then right it hits the barrier it hits that slit and it bends around it we can detect that right so my orange lines here on this detector if you had um, a wave going through a narrow slit the um bending would show up such that you would get a really bright or a really strong signal right in the middle, and then it would kind of taper off. Now, this is maybe not that interesting on its own with just a single slit, but if you were to take two slits, right, as the waves hit that barrier with the slits, 
you would see bending around both obstacles at the same time. But now those two waves going away from the barrier after they have bent are going to interfere with each other. So what you will find is that there are specific points at which, and you can kind of see what I've circled, where a line hits a line, that's a crest and a crest, that's our constructive interference, and we end up with a bright signal or a really strong signal where those interfered constructively, they built each other up. Wherever the lines go over the spaces, that's a crest over a trough, that's where things are going to cancel out. That's destructive interference. And even though there are only two slits, when you put waves through a barrier with two slits, the signal pattern that you get has individual peaks with blank spots in between. And it even has the biggest peak directly across from the barrier. So the point where the waves don't go through is where you have the biggest or brightest peak because it has the most constructive interference. So we're gonna contrast this with what would happen with particles. Um, and this, right, not a trick question. So if you have particles and you shoot them all at a screen with one slit, you will just see one peak directly across from that slit where the particles went through and then hit the detector screen. If you put particles through a screen with two slits, you would see two peaks, right? It's a particle, it's, right, imagine tennis balls shooting through a barrier and then hitting a wall. You are only gonna see a signal directly across from the opening. Now the question is, what happens with electrons? Do electrons behave like waves? Do they behave like particles? Does anything change that? And I'm going to send you to another video for this because it's already been done so well. There's a Dr. Quantum video linked on Canvas. You should watch the Dr. Quantum video to see exactly what happens when we take electrons and we put them through the single and double slit experiment.